Well, hello, I am George, and I am a recovering alcoholic. And uh, I was talking to Julie uh, when I first came in the door, and I said I didn't get to bed till 3 o'clock and got up at 8 this morning. And, and she thought, it was, she asked, well, was, was it because I was afraid to speak? And uh, I didn't think so, because I haven't had much trouble talking in all my years in sobriety. But I am terrified this morning, and I, I don't know why. So uh, I'm being honest to start off my talk. Uh, because I understand that a lot of the speakers here have a lot of sobriety. And um, May the 5th of, uh, of this year would have been my 21st year of sobriety had I not taken one drink uh, at nine and a half years of, of sobriety. And uh, one drink uh, was all it was. And um, I was going to prove to my ex uh, what would happen if she brought wine into the house. So I showed her, <laughs> and uh, that's the honesty of, of what my anger uh, will do uh, to me. And I, um, I think I want to talk about recovery and uh, what it means, because that one drink was really necessary for me. Um, it, was the, it was the thing at nine and a half years I feel that my first nine and a half years of sobriety uh, was what you would call white knuckle. I still felt uncomfortable in most situations. I still felt phony. I still was very self-centered. I still was very manipulative, controlling, abusive, and angry. About, a, about one year after taking that drink, I had my third divorce. Um, and, uh, that was, um, and I had courted that woman and uh, married her and had a child with her all in sobriety. And I thought my life was on this upward course because now I had the right woman. And so uh, in this battle with her, um, I took this drink. And that was the thing that began to turn me around. Um, I don't know um, how all of you feel about outside help, but at this point is where I got outside help. And um, because I had those deep issues that it says when you do your inventory, you need to look at those things that happened to you that put a twist in your life. And up until that point, I didn't even know that anything uh, deep had happened to me that put a twist in my relationship with, with the opposite sex. And uh, when, that third divorce, uh, when, that th when that third divorce happened, I began to look really into some more issues. And um, I can say that um, over the course of time, um, I now understand a lot of, of my whole life. And so when I say that one drink um, was, uh, it, I don't know if it was necessary. It might have been better not to have done it, because then I could say 21 years, right? And I, I remember for a couple of years after I took that drink, I hated going to a meeting where they did countdowns. I just resented it. I, I resented the hell out of countdowns. And it made me really, well, then in that anger, I said, we all each have only one day of sobriety. No, Right? I mean, that's the way it's supposed to be. The guy who gets up first in the morning is the guy who has the longest sobriety for that day. They used to say that a lot when I first came in. But, um, <laughs> but uh, I realized that was just my resentment speaking when I would try to say that. So um, I, don't, I don't say it anymore because I have to uh, say I would like to be able to stand here and say I have 21 years of continuous sobriety. Although I didn't get drunk, one glass of wine did not, did not get, get me drunk. And I immediately called a guy in Cheney. I got sober in Cheney. And I immediately called a guy and went and talked to him. He came and got me. We went up on a hill outside of Cheney. And we sat in the car and talked about my, about my rage that had gotten me into that trouble. And, uh, but uh, like I say, uh, I really am scared, you guys. I have not been this scared talking in a, quite, a, quite some time. Uh, the main reason is uh, I, one of the things I, I know in my early sobriety, uh, ha being one of those uh, intellectuals who has a college degree, a BA in English, and a Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing, uh, all my stories had to have a beginning and a middle and an ending. And, and so I would sit there while other people were talking, and I'd be planning my talk. And over the last few years, I've really tried to say, OK, higher power, what am I supposed to talk about at, at the moment I'm talking? And try not to plan 
and try to listen to what other people uh, are saying. And it leads to a moment like this where I really am uh, rather scared because my higher power is not telling me what to say except the truth. And um, it's uh, right now, I, um, uh, there are a lot of things going on in my life, many, many things like moving, like a daughter, a 15-year-old daughter moving back into my house who uh, a year ago was living on the streets and is having a trouble with alcohol and drugs, a girlfriend who's fighting with me, uh, I, I, I buying a new car, a new used car, and uh, just running around like crazy, so crazy, by the way, that I scheduled two talks within 45 minutes of each other today. I was supposed to be over at the, the goodbye celebration for the Alano Club to chair a meeting at 1 o'clock, and then I only realized this week that I had this thing to, to speak at, and so there I was with two two engagements within 45 minutes. Fortunately, none of the meetings are happening over there. So <laughs> I just went over and watched some, uh, they're showing a nice tape about um, Reno Night, when it's, when it's some of the uh, things they did over there. Um, uh, and my, my very first meeting was in that club. Now I know the club has nothing to do with AA. I mean, uh, I understand very well, but I have a lot of fond memories of that club. My first meeting was at the Wednesday Men's New Life meeting. And um, uh, I'll, I can't, I, I remember that first meeting, I came in and I knew I was home immediately. And, and I had never, I was uh, 39 years old and I had never known what it was like to feel at, at home. And in fact, um, my cup at the Alano Club now says Cheney George, uh, because Cheney, uh, I began to realize after a little sobriety uh, was the first place in my whole life where I had felt that I was at home and uh, where people uh, were my family. And uh, at the time I, I got to uh, sobriety, I was beginning to uh, leave. If something wasn't going right in one town, I would move to the next town. And my, my course had, left, had taken me from Dayton, Ohio, to Mobile, Alabama, to New Orleans, and then to Cheney. And, uh, and that move was uh, after my second divorce, uh, which uh, it was out of a marriage that had lasted uh, six months. And when she hit me with her hard hat, strangled me and threw me out, I, <laughs> true, she was tough. She was a shipboard electrician. And uh, when she threw me out, I remember I threw all my belongings into the back of a Volkswagen. That's, that's the level at which I was living. I uh, bought a, a six pack of those big, uh, Schlitz beers, cans, they were, uh, what are they, 18 ounces? I had to have that and began drinking and driving on my trip to Cheney. And the reason I came up to this corner of the United States was it was the only, um, the only part, uh, one of the corners I hadn't lived in. I'd lived up in Nantucket, I'd list down, lived down in Miami, and, I, and so I said, well, let's try another corner. <laughs> and you know, I mean, truly, that is alcoholic thinking, right? I'm, I'll show you, I'll just do this spontaneous, crazy move. But the interesting thing was, is that uh, the, I found in Cheney, the very first friend I made there was clear back from Erie, Pennsylvania, a neighboring state from me. And he was sober, and he became my AA sponsor. And I had to come all the way from Ohio, where AA started, out to Cheney, Washington, to find AA. Because I do not truly remember ever hearing the word AA in Ohio at all. So that's, that is, to me, one of those strange things. And when I say that he really was the, he was the first guy I met and the first guy I began to talk to, the guy who became my sponsor. And uh, um, he was in the same uh, writing program I was in. He liked acting, drama, movies. It was like finding a brother. And uh, that's how we got to know each other. But he began to, you can't, you know, we say, well, you can't lead a guy to, to a sobriety. But those guys, he and his sponsor, who's Irish Jim, I'm sure some of you know Irish Jim, uh, began to work on me. And I'd be telling them about my problems, and every once in a while they'd say something like, uh, maybe it's alcohol. <laughs> they just drop that little thing in my ear from time to time. And so finally one day, uh, again over a woman when I was drinking uh, and trying to start a new job, getting off that job, buying a six-pack at the gold coin, which is now closed, almost drinking that whole six-pack by the time I'd hit Cheney, just gobbling one beer after the other. 
Uh, finally, when I, real, when I broke down and couldn't take it anymore, I showed up at this guy's home, uh, Jeff P., who's still my sponsor, and said, I can't take it anymore. And uh, he said, well, can you put down that Budweiser? I had a Budweiser. And he says, can you stay sober? It was about, by the time I got to his house, 2 a.m., there weren't any meetings at that time. And he said, can you stay sober till tomorrow evening, and I'll take you to a meeting. And we went to the Wednesday Men's New Life. And that was my beginning um, in sobriety. And uh, the thing I really want to emphasize today, I think, is uh, this morning I was at a CODA meeting. Uh, this afternoon I'm at an AA meeting. And this evening I'm going with my girlfriend to an Al-Anon meeting. So I know a lot of these 12-step programs. And this morning in the CODA meeting I was sitting and discussing, uh, we talk a lot about relationships. And uh, I was talking about uh, all these things that are happening right now in my life. And I was sitting in absolute comfort, and I was in serenity. And I was discussing all these things, and I was remembering the kind of rage and power and drive that I would have had to solve these problems 20 years ago when I was still drinking, how I would have done them even, like I say, 11 years ago when I took that, that one drink of wine. <clears throat> And I realize that I have truly come, I think, to accept my powerlessness, not only over alcohol, but what I learned after that drink and began then to live a life, began to learn things about myself, is how powerless I truly am over everything. You know, I can manipulate, control, try to dominate. <clears throat> I can do all kinds of things to make people do what I want them to do, and it's never worked. It's caused me three divorces. And, and to, to, and, but I think the thing that drove me crazy as I think about my drinking career was over and over again I'd be powerless and I wouldn't want to accept that. And I would drink and rage and scream and kick and hit walls and break windows and, and do all those kind of things and, uh, because I could not stand the thought that I was powerless. And I can now look, look around and... I can see that I am powerless, and it doesn't drive me crazy anymore. And if, 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 if I can see that, that that's one of the greatest gifts that uh, AA has given me. And I remember the moment, and again, it relates to that drink of wine. Jeez. Anyhow, <clears throat> I, was a, I, I had that drink of wine, and within a few months, my wife left me at that time. And I did the AA thing. I was in going to meetings. I went to a meeting every day for that first year. And I would constantly take my own inventory in those meetings. I'd say, I did this. I was selfish, self-centered to the extreme. I would do exactly uh, what AA had told me to do, take my own inventory, take my own inventory. And I remember meeting upstairs in the Alano Club in the upstairs room, the little room back in the corner, the nooner. And... Uh, and I had just finished doing this talk about how lousy I was, what a bum I was, what a rotten person I was, how manipulative and controlling I was. And then when my talk was done, I felt shame and guilt, and I sat in that corner, and I was really uncomfortable. And for the first time, I asked myself, I said, all right, all right, Jordan, you are selfish. There's no doubt about it. You've just driven a third wife away. I said, you truly are selfish. And then for the first time, a question came into my mind, yeah, but why are you selfish? Why are you selfish? And then for the first time, I did a flop, and I saw that who I was. Now, this is not AA. <laughs> this, this I, I realize, sometimes upsets AA people. But I realized that I was what I was because I made choices when I was four and five and six years old that were defensive against being a victim. And so that I realized I had become an alcoholic, abusive, and controlling, and manipulative because I was also a victim. And I did the flip-flop. I began to see myself as an abusive, manipulative, controlling person, but I also understood that I had only done that because it was my way of trying not ever to feel powerless again. See? And then I really understood at depth the source of my uh, addictions to women, to alcohol, to whatever I did in order not to be powerless again. 
And I think it's in the big book where it says there's two basic types of personality. There are those that are really kind and sweet, and they kind of wheedle at you to get what they want. Then there are the dominating ones that walk all over you, right? And then there are all the things in between. And, but each one of those, both of those personality types are just trying to get their needs met and to keep from losing what they have or to try to get something they don't have. And you know how it talks about that. And I really see that I was this domineering person that was just trying not to have to be powerless again, not to be alone again, not to be poor again, not to be drifting again. And of course, everything I was doing when I was drinking was not any growth. It was just constantly wallowing in this stuff. And, and, what, uh, and wh what I think has happened in sobriety, so that I, I, I see my recovery from two sources. One, realizing that I'm abuser and abusive, and the other, that I'm a victim. And what has happened, uh, the, as I can see recovery, is that now, one day at a time, I live my life, I face the things that come down the path, I, life on life's terms, and I feel my feelings as I go through them. I don't run from them. Sometimes it's anger, sometimes it's joy, sometimes it's sorrow, sometimes it's depression. But I mean, it's just life coming to me. And if I walk through anything that comes my way sober, you know, if I face it head on, and that that is the whole process of recovering and rejoining the human race. It's just living life one day at a time uh, as it comes down the pike. And uh, uh, I saw that today, I saw that this morning in, my, in the CODA meeting, that's what I was sharing, is that I was going through oh, a lot of things all at once, over which I'm all powerless, uh, but I have these meetings to come to, I have my friendships in the 12-step groups, and uh, I have counseling when I want it, I reach outside to other stuff. And I'm not alone. I don't feel alone. I don't feel lost. I just, I just am walking through it. And to, uh, all of that began with a guy saying to me and Cheney, maybe it's alcohol. Maybe it's alcohol. So my basic recovery program is still AA, even though there's a lot of other things now that I put into the mix. And, 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 but I do always want to remember, I have a home group. It's the Sunday Morning Unity. So I still always stay in contact with, uh, with AA, that this is my basic thing. When I got alcohol out of the way, I could begin this growth process. And it's a wonderful process. And it, brought me, it brings me here to talk and share this stuff, even though my mouth is dry as, as, as cotton, I'll tell you. But it, it brings me here where I can keep sharing this. And somehow in the sharing of these things, in these meetings, where we share our secrets, we share our lives, where you don't find this too much out in the world. There's no places where you see people trying to, be, trying to be honest. We're not always honest. But where people are trying to be honest about what's happened to them and how they've lived and what's happened to them and what they've learned. And, and this, this, is the, this is a wonderful place, this sharing. And this, uh, this place where you can tell your secrets some of them, there might be some things you can't, you need to share with your sponsor, but where you can tell these secrets, and somehow that sharing takes away that loneliness that I used to feel. I think just the ability to say to you, I did this, I did that, I was manipulative, I was cruel to wives, I was abusive, you know, not physically, just a very verbally abusive person. And uh, I can tell you those things, and as I tell you them, they go away. Uh, yeah, they really do go away. Um, because I am acting now in my relationships with my ex-wives, my girlfriend, my daughter, in ways that I never could have done uh, 20 years ago. Uh, and that is just be still and let people be what they are. And if they leave, they leave. If they stay, they stay. And uh, uh, always trying to change my behavior and trying not to change the other person's behavior. Uh, so I think I've run to the end. I think. My higher power just said shut up, and thank you all for uh, letting me share. <laughs>